Julia Bond joins the show and shares some personal stories along her bowling journey, along with her experience as the assistant coach at the University of Nebraska and more. I'm Tim Young, and this is The Bowler's Mind. Hi, Julia. Welcome to the show, and thanks for being here. Hi, Tim. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So you are currently the assistant coach at the University of Nebraska's bowling program, but you didn't start that way. You were originally a, a student athlete and were very successful. In fact, one of the one of the best bowlers they've ever had in program history. Would you tell me a little bit more about your college years as a bowler? Yeah. So when I look back at my time at Nebraska, like it was fun. Like I had a great time. I had a good relationship with my coaches, you know, Coach Straub and Coach Klumpa. And I was just very grateful to be a part of that program. Like when I was deciding where I wanted to go, I, you know, 18 year old me wasn't very complicated. I just like, I want to go somewhere where I'm going to win. Like I yeah. want to have an opportunity to win. And so it wasn't really like complicated, but, you know, looking back on it, it was more than that. Like I realized that Nebraska was where I was going to grow as a person. It was where I was going to grow as a bowler and just, you know, learn how to be an adult, if that makes sense. And so I had a really good time with my teammates and my coaches. And I feel like I really grew into my own there. Like I remember distinctly um, my sophomore year when I came home from the holidays and, you know, the people that essentially watched me grow up bowling, I came home and they were like, you're different. Hmm. And they're like, it's not bad. Like you're, you're like, you're still wonderful. <laughs> like it's not bad, but you're, you're different. And I was like, well, I mean, I, I guess I feel the same. And I was like, what do you mean? And they're just like, you just seem more like sure of yourself. And I feel like Nebraska gave me that confidence, you know, to to be that type of person because, you know, I anchored from my sophomore to my senior year. And when you can say that you've anchored for one of the best programs in the country, I think naturally that kind of puts a little bit of a pep in your step. Yeah, a little confidence builder. And, mm -hmm. So I was really grateful for that time and to, to, you know, develop that confidence and just, you know, help me become the person that I am today. And you know, I'm really grateful that I get to go back as a coach and keep that legacy going and to, you know, essentially coach the next generation of female athletes. And, you know, I just want to help them with, you know, develop the tools to, you know, be great bowlers, but be great human beings, because, you know, the world isn't always, you know, so nice or fair to female right. athletes. And so there's some skills that, you know, I want to make sure that when they leave, um, they're going to be lifelong skills for themselves. What did you study in college? Forensic biology. Okay. Very nice. <laughs> do, you ever, yeah, do, you ever, do you ever hope to be able to use that in the future? Uh, I mean, not anymore. Okay. Like I, in high school, I, I really enjoyed like DNA. Like DNA was like my passion. Like when in bio, when we were learning about just what it is and just how this tiny microscopic molecule like makes me, me and makes you, you. And we're about 99%. It's similar, the same, like our DNA is just so close, but it's that 1% that makes us different. And I thought that was, that was just the coolest thing that I've ever heard. And I was like, all right, okay, cool. What, what can I do with that? Like what, what are, what opportunities, like, how can I make this work? And I've always been into forensics. I feel like everybody has a little bit of a true crime mm -hmm. kind of like, yeah. you know, I think everybody is interested in the macabre okay. to some extent. Right. <laughs> and you know, I went through the classes and I had a really great time. And when it came down to it, when I graduated, I sat down with my parents and I was thinking like, okay, how are we, what's our, what's our game plan? What are mm -hmm. we going to do as a family? And we kind of arbitrarily picked three years that three just seemed like a good number of like, you know, go on tour for three years, see if you like it. And if you don't, then we'll pivot and mm. see how we can get you to be a forensic scientist. And you know, luckily in those three years, I've won three titles and one of them being a major. So I was like, I think, I yeah. think I like this. Like, I, <laughs> I think it's, I think it's going to be okay. But, but I really believe that if it didn't work out, I think I would have really loved to be a forensic scientist. I think no matter what path I would have chosen, I think, I think I would have had a good time doing either one. Is there anything in that that has helped you in bowling being a, that obviously it's a you know totally different mm -hmm. field, but is there anything, uh, you know, obviously, let's say if you were a physicist, you probably, that would kind of help understand ball motion, right. that sort of thing, you know, <laughs> but as a forensic biologist, is there anything that has helped you 
in your bowling career? I would just say attention to detail. And, you know, bowling's not very black and white. There's some things that are, but for the most part, there's a lot of gray area on, you know, not everything is a one size fits all, but just attention to detail and um, being very process based. I feel like it's very easy in bowling to become outcome based because, I mean, yeah, ultimately at the end of the day, you're trying to strike like it is a result based game. But when you get to like the professional and elite level, I think it really is more like process based. Like if you pay attention to those steps and if you do those steps to, you know, correctly to the best of your ability, the outcome, you know, will happen, you know, right. and again, in a very ideal right. situation. Right. And I feel like forensics and going through those classes, it is very process and step based. There are certain okay. things that, you know, need to happen in order to get, you know, to where you're supposed to go. And so there's a little bit of, I think, overlap there, but I like but not like monotonous work, monotonous. How do you say that? I like that kind of work where it's just repetitive. And I don't get bored of that. I very much enjoy it. And I feel like bowling at its core is repetitive and, you know, consistency. And those are things that my brain just really, really enjoys <laughs> and really loves. And so I, I think it makes sense to me. I think bowling makes sense to me. I just love doing things <laughs> over and over and getting over the result that I want. <laughs> it's, just, it's great. I love it. Does that, is that ever a struggle for you? Uh, the concept you mentioned just a few minutes ago about uh, process over results or process over outcome, like not being outcome oriented, but being process oriented. Is that ever a challenge for you going back and forth? Cause obviously you do, like you said, you want to strike. That's, that's the goal. And there are times when it's just, that's really a difficult thing to do. And staying in that process mindset, is that a challenge? Oh, a hundred percent. I feel like we all go through that where you kind of lose yourself a little mm -hmm. bit and the frustration takes over and, you know, even though I said, I like, you know, repetitive work, I am not patient. Mm -hmm. I've never known myself to be patient. I've worked <laughs> on it. I'm a lot better than, you know, when I was younger. But um, I think there are moments where uh, that gets away from me. The times where, because there are moments where I feel like I'm doing everything right. Mm. I feel like I'm doing the steps, but I'm not striking. Right. And so it's those it's it's those moments where, yeah, it's very hard to say process based when you feel like you're doing the process correctly, but you're not getting the result. And so, yeah, I think. It, is, it, can, it can be difficult. And like for me specifically, I'm not a particularly powerful player. Like I am very more um, of a traditional style, not a lot of moving parts. Um, I don't have a weak game per se, but it's just not the most powerful that you're going to see. And so there are instances where um, I am fighting against that a little bit. Like I'm hitting, like I said, I'm hitting my mark. I feel like I'm using the right ball, but I'm just not getting like the corners out. And so there's times where I feel like I have to be smarter than everybody else. Like, if that makes sense, like, it's like, okay, I, have, I have to be throwing it better than they are and I have to be, I have to be making smarter decisions. And so when, and I'm okay with that, I've accepted that, but there's moments where it's just like, dang, like, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to have to be smarter all the time. <laughs> so yeah, there's moments where it's a struggle, but I mean, I, I enjoy that challenge of bowling. I think that's why I fell in love with it in the first place. As you reference being a less powerful player, do you find that then your game has to be more accurate or more accuracy oh, yeah. based where someone who has more power can get away with stuff? Yeah, by default. Like, yeah. and that, and again, it can be frustrating, but I've taken a lot of pride in that in my game. I, I, I don't want to say brag, but I feel like there is a little bit of a bragging, right? Just like, yeah, I can hit my target. Of course I can. Like, and it's, it's something that I think about. It happened recently and it just, lives in my brain rent free we were we were at team usa camp and we were doing this really fun drill where um we had to um, basically start as far right as we can like you went one person at a time and you had to like move across the lane and whoever and you again you have to hit your mark and so it was one team against the other and we were like well how far right can any of us hit and then brown and looks at me and she's like can you hit two and i'm like yeah like, yeah, I can hit the board too. <laughs> and then I went up there and I nailed it. I aced it. And I was yeah. like, I just, yeah, just, uh, just great. <laughs> and I, I love that feeling. Down. I like, I, I take pride in the ability to, to say that. Right. As a coach, do you find it more stressful 
being a coach as compared to you competing on the lanes yourself? Uh, yeah, my girls have asked me that <laughs> now that we're three years in. And I, yeah, I think it is more stressful as a coach because I feel like as a player, I had control over the situation. Right. Like if my coaches came to me and they're like, you need, you need to do this, you need this, or you need to strike right. like anything. And so I felt like, okay, great. Like, that's fine. Like I, I can do this, like, you know, give me the ball. Whereas as a coach, I have to, <laughs> it's my, it's my girls now. Right. So I, I believe in them a hundred percent. Like I have full faith and full confidence, but I don't, I don't have control anymore. I'm just giving them information to the best of my ability and hoping that we're right, because that's all bowling ever really is, is just educated guesses. <laughs> we never know if something's actually going to work out. Share with me a little bit about your bowling journey, how you first got into bowling and what led you up to college. I know you had a lot of success, even in junior gold. Can you share a little more about that? Yeah. So I feel like I'm what I call like a late bloomer Okay. as far as bowling goes. I only started when I was 11 mm. and I have a lot of friends who were like, oh yeah, like I was three or I was five. Right. And I was like, dang. It's not fair. <laughs> bowling wasn't even a thought because I don't really come from a bowling family that way. Like my grandparents bowled and like my dad remembers watching bowling Saturday mornings and they watched as a family, but we, I did not grow up in a bowling alley or anything like that. And so when I was um, about 11, my dad, uh, his friends at work decided to join a bowling league and they asked my dad if he wanted to be their sub. So I guess dad wasn't cool enough to be <laughs> like, <laughs> on the member. starting roster, but <laughs> he asked him if he wanted to sub. And he's like, yeah, because he, he remembers, you know, again, like watching bowling in the mornings. And so right. he loved it. And, you know, I truly believe this about my family. You know, we don't do anything half-assed, just never have been, never will. And so my dad's like, well, okay, if I'm going to sub, then I need my own shoes, I need my own stuff. And like, I'm going to go practice. And so he would, like, I would just tag along, you know, my dad and I are very close. And, you know, I would just go to the center because at this point I still associated bowling with like birthday parties okay, and just something like fun to do. And like, it was like something I would only go to maybe once a year, maybe like every other year. And so I thought bowling alleys were special, like a special place <laughs> at this point. And so I would tag along and, you know, bowl with him and he would be, you know, pointing out people like, you know, see how, you know, they're moving and their steps and seeing how they're throwing the ball and just trying my best to kind of mimic that way by watching. And the man who owned the pro shop, you know, got to see my dad and I very often and started noticing me. And he's like, hey, like, I've noticed you and your daughter come in here pretty often. Like, would she be interested in like doing lessons? And at this point, like, I've never done like a sport, like, like my, we like watching sports as a family, like, you know, we're an athletic family, but I just never like tried out for anything. Nothing really spoke to me that way but you know it's just like well yeah sure I guess now's you know any you know why not now and uh yeah I took lessons and I fell in love with it and joined my first like Saturday league and just was hooked from there and um took some, again took some lessons from the pro shop um owner and eventually got to a certain point and realized and again got some information I feel like that's very important you know for parents and you know, kids nowadays is that information. There's so many opportunities for a scholarship or just, you know, just again, the opportunities are endless. And so once, once we, you know, got that information, we we're like, okay, like we, you can go to college. Like my parents didn't go to college, you know, just graduated high school, go straight into the workforce type of situation. And so to have the opportunity to like potentially like pay, you know, to pay my way to go to school on my own, I was just like that. It's just, it, it was just crazy. It was just the, the thought of it. I thought it was just opera, just again, mind blowing. Like even now I have a hard time finding the words. Cause again, it's like, I got, a, I got my school paid for, you know, all these opportunities because of bowling. And I just, I just think it's wonderful. You know, here we are. So just, um, basically pushing myself at every level where right. I could, you know, at the high school level, like, okay, I want to, like, what records can I break in high school? Like, you know, what can we do there? I want to win state, you know, then going to college, it's like, I want to win a, you know, national championship. Like I want to be on TV, like all that other stuff. And so I've been very fortunate that I've been able to uh, find success at every level. I'm very grateful for it. How would you compare 
the competition level you experienced at junior gold as compared to at the college level? And then, and then college to, to the PWBA, like how, how do those different levels? Cause I mean, there's a lot of great bowlers in, in, uh, Mm -hmm. in junior gold. Uh, and so I was just curious how those different levels were experienced to you. I guess at junior gold, there is a certain point where it is comparable to college. And so maybe not qualifying, like, again, we love qualifying. Like, you know, there's, there's, I'll say that junior gold is a very special event because you have, um, kids at various different levels. And so, but once you make it past that first cut, I think that's, again, that's where you get to a different talent level. Right. And so I think that's where it starts getting comparable to college because, you know, you have some, uh, like, again, your college freshmen, you know, they're 18, 19 years old. And Mm -hmm. again, I'm, I'm old now. And so the divisions (laughs) that junior cold has now are a little bit different than when I bowled. So like when I was 16, I was in the U20. There was no U16. There was no like U15. So like I'm 16 bowling against like 19, 20, you know, 20 year old people who are like, right. People who are going into college when I'm just 16. And so, and I remember that I remember because 2013 is when I won junior bowl. And I remember, I didn't know it at the time, but I was seeing some of my future (laughs) collegiate teammates like at those final rounds at junior gold. And so I just, I think that's cool. But yeah, I feel like when you get to that upper tier in junior gold is when it's comparable okay. uh, to college. And then from college to the pro level, it's still comparable. Like, I guess it's kind of hard to explain. <sighs> Cause at the professional level, it really is a different tier. Like there's a, there's a lot of great bowlers in college. I see it every day now. And so, but there's just a different level of shot making at the pro level. Like, cause there's plenty of talent in college. Like there is such an abundance of talent. Even again, either at the youth level, at the collegiate level, the, the amount of consistent shot making that you see at pros is just, that's why it's at a different level so like overall there is a lot of overlap like where the levels kind of there's like that bridge like those people right. who are like getting to the next level but every level has kind of its upper like epsilon right so to speak and so i feel like it feels like it's unattainable but when you finally break through that one level it becomes like easier like i don't think people really realize this but like prior to me winning junior gold i never made the cut Mm. like the the year that i won was the first time i made oh wow that cut and then every year after that i never missed Mm. like i you know i was in the top whatever every year making all the cuts and so that's kind of maybe my little like tidbit is that even if that ceiling feels like it's far away like once you break it like it it becomes easier i promise like again that's kind of that new sense of confidence if that makes sense and so keep trying because once you finally break through like you'll you'll keep breaking through. It's great. How does someone break through? Like, I mean, you, you kept trying and trying and then what, what suddenly got you through? See, I feel like that's a million dollar question. Yeah. Right. I feel like if we knew the answer to that, just we'd all be doing it. But I think, I mean, there has to be some level of belief in yourself. People who don't believe in themselves don't I mean, I, I feel like that sounds kind of rude, but If you don't believe in yourself to get to that point, you're probably not. There has to be some internal drive and belief that you can get to that point. And so I think there's a level of confidence and I think there's a level of being prepared. Like you have to prepare like for that next level. Like you can't, you can't want to be here, but doing this like, effort or work here if that makes sense there's that doesn't that doesn't make sense and so something that our head coach even yes exactly and like something our head coach says is um uh failing to prepare is preparing to fail right like we like again that's kind of a fancy way of just saying it's like if you're not preparing to get to where you want to go you're not going to get to where you want to go or you're not going to be able to consistently maintain right but if that makes sense yeah absolutely but like you said, if you could do put all the work possible in, 
But then at the end of the day, if you don't believe you can achieve it, then you're kind of hamstringing yourself to some extent. Right. And, and again, like, I feel like I'm talking in absolutes, but there is no like absolutes. Like, yeah, I'm saying these things, but you know, you're going to have your outlier or, you know, you're going to have these people who maybe have the confidence, but again, I feel like we're just, there's so many different variations or scenarios where like you can have someone who has all this confidence, but maybe they don't put the work in or someone who puts out like, and we, it's, I don't know. It's hard. Like, I just, I wish, I wish there was just like a formula, like, you know, X, Y, Y, and Z, and then right, right. you're going to get here. And so, but I think, I think ultimately at the end of the day, you're as good as you want to be. Like whatever level you're trying to get at, if you put in, you know, the time and again, I'm not going to sit here and act like there's not a level of like resources right? you need to have. And, you know, some of us are more fortunate than others to have access to those resources, but I don't want that to stop people right. from still doing what they can with the means that they have. And so, yeah, but I, yeah, overall I, people, people are as good as they want to be putting in the work, having the confidence and the drive, the desire to want to get to that next level, I think is really important. Tell me a little bit about, uh, I saw on your Instagram that you spend a fair amount of time in a pro shop drilling equipment, uh, resurfacing balls, that kind of stuff. Is that something you've done for a long time or is that something since you've been in Nebraska? That's been, that's a new skill to me. That's been within the last like three years of me being at Nebraska okay. and like, so but as far as like cleaning balls and like resurfacing stuff, that's like, those are things I knew how to do. But as far as like, again, more of the drilling and again, I'm still learning. And so our head coach and I have this really nice kind of like system kind of like a conveyor belt where like he's the one that's doing the layouts and drilling the line like or you know doing the lines and i'm actually the ones that like putting the holes in it so we'll do the thumb first i'll you know put the you know put the thumb hole in give it back to him and then he measures the fingers off of the thumb and then you know does the lines and then i put the holes in it and so that's kind of our system that we have now and so in time eventually that will be more i will get to a point where i will be also doing the layouts and taking over more of the pro shop, but again, with the collegiate season, it gets busy. And so it's, I don't want to say a slow process on getting me caught up there, but the system we have now works for us, uh, for now. And so, but definitely enjoy learning those things. I feel like, um, it's definitely important to, you know, the professional side, you know, me wanting to bowl on tour and cause I mean, everybody's different. Like I, some people are more technical. Some people want to know the layouts and are very in tuned to what those are. You have other people that um, do or pay more attention to just shapes and ball motion. Like that's what speaks to them. And then you have people who are like in between. And I feel like I'm kind of an in-between person. Like um, I pay attention to the numbers and try to make good choices based off of the numbers. But ultimately, again, I, I'm looking like I'm using my eyes and seeing the shapes, you know, that I'm seeing. And I think ultimately at the end of the day, that's how I make choices. But it's been very, it's been very interesting to just learn more on the technical side cool. of bowling. When you're able to practice, I don't know how often you, you like to practice, but do you like having a structured practice where you kind of have a list of things you're working on? Or do you like to just kind of go and, and see what your body's telling you and just kind of work on things that way? It's a little bit of a mix. And so with the new job has come me trying to rework my practice schedule and so prior to me having this job you know i was telling you like our three-year plan and so i was living at home with my parents Mm. so i didn't bowling was my job so i didn't have any bills to pay (laughs) yeah i didn't have anywhere to be and so i just spent my days practicing and you know with my coach he's out in uh displays i live in my parents live in aurora And so it's about maybe an hour away and I would just spend, you know, two, three, four hours just up there practicing. And again, it would be just, sometimes you would have a goal sometimes depending on where my game's at currently, we would just be working on footwork. Like for example, like then that's a really good example. My footwork um, kind of, I think everybody has like a physical Mm -hmm. thing that kind of creeps up Mm -hmm. every once in a while. Like you'll have it down for maybe a few months and then all of a sudden it's like, what are you what are we doing here? What's going on? (laughs) And so sometimes you just kind of need a little reminder or like a refresher. And so like my feet are, my feet are a really good example. So I like to slide in 
like my first step wants to kind of go in front and then the rest of my feet follow. And so sometimes, and so, so, and now as you, you know, work on these things, sometimes you just need like a quick cue. And so all I have, like my coach is like, you know, you're starting to slide in, just make sure your first step's going straight. And then we're back on track. So sometimes it's, as, sometimes it's as easy as that. Sometimes we're trying to just learn an entirely new skill. You know, we'll go through a couple tournaments and kind of see like, all right, what'd you do? What went well? What didn't go well? Was there an angle that we were trying to play, but you weren't comfortable playing or we just couldn't quite do it? Right. So it kind of depends on like, again, where I'm going or like what we're working towards. Right. And so. Are you currently working on anything? Yeah. Like. Simply like ha- staying more behind it. Okay. And so. If you look at my ball rotation, so I have a really, not a really low tilt, but I have a low tilt. It's about, you know, I think the last time you checked it, it's like 13 degrees. But then my rotation naturally is at 70. So I have a low tilt and a really high rotation. And so that's not necessarily bad on paper, but there's certain situations or certain angles that I try to play that I just, I feel like my ball just wants to go 60 feet. And that's because of the high rotation part. And so at camp, you know, Brian O'Keefe and I were talking and just feeling like if I can get my rotation down to like maybe 50, having, um, being able to feel like I can bowl, uh, at a higher level on more often, if that makes sense. Cause again, there have been times where as we've moved left, um, you know, you know, bowling, we say that, you know, the lanes get cliffed where it feels like there's so much hook, right. But then it feels like there's like a wall of oil, like in the middle. And so like with my rotation, it felt like I was kind of stuck. So with my high rotation, if I hit that dry, it would just react so sharply and just more than what I want. But then if I got it in the oil, then it just wants to go freaking forever. And so if I can get that rotation. That higher tilt tends to cause the ball to, it gets down the lane stronger, but then has a more violent tilt where if you're more behind it, it's more Mm rolly. Right. Exactly. And so, like I said, naturally, I want to be at 70, 75 degrees. And so if we can just get down to like 50, 55, I think I'll have an easier time. Because there's times where I feel like I, like I said, like what I was telling you earlier, I feel like I have to be like smarter or I have to like throw it better compared to people who might naturally have a little bit more power. It just felt like I had to, I don't want to say do so much, but I had to like rely on surface a lot. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like surface is still a very valuable tool, you know, for us. And like I said, nothing wrong with that, but there's just times where it's just like, man, I feel like I'm trying like so, so hard to get the shapes that I want. But if I can, if I can get that rotation again, more to like 55%, I don't, I think hopefully it'll, I won't feel like I have to try so hard or do so much to get the right shape that I'm looking for. So that's kind of where we're, where we're at. So you've competed on some of the largest stages, like you talked about uh, winning Queens. How do you manage the nerves when you get to those, you know, TV shows when you're under the hot lights and you're the only one up bowling and everyone's watching you and there's cameras and that sort of thing? How do you, how do you stay focused? Fabulous question. Um, First step is to admit that I'm nervous. Hmm. I feel like that's the important thing is to, if you are nervous, to acknowledge that feeling and not shame yourself for it. There's nothing wrong with being nervous. You know, we all get nervous in those situations. And I feel like nerves are just a sign that, you know, what you're doing means something to you. You know, again, I feel like a lot of people have said this, you know, really great athletes have said this. If you're not nervous and you don't, you must not want it. (laughs) You must not want it very badly. And so I think, you know, if you are nervous, acknowledging that and not shaming yourself for it, but also maybe trying to reframe it. like. Um, I tend to be like a naturally nervous person, I think in my everyday life, um, not terribly so, but again, I'm a planner. I like not a control freak, but I like things to be kind of a certain way or to, you know, hopefully go a certain way. And if they don't, then it's just like, it's like, okay, we need to pivot, (laughs) but I need a second (laughs) stuff like that. And so, but reframing it, it's like, okay, I feel nervous, but like, am I actually just excited? Right. Like, ner- I feel like nervous has such like a negative connotation mm-hmm. and like nerves, like I said, nerves don't have to be bad. 
it can show that you're really excited to be doing what you're doing. Like those butterflies could just be your body telling you that like, I'm ready, like I'm ready to go. And so I think framing, re- learning how to reframe that, feeling, I think to a more positive experience, I think definitely helps. And then for me personally, my focus gets more like this way in those situations. And so I personally enjoy those situations where it is just me up there. I'm like, oh, thank you. Like I'm so, t- cause like I'm qualifying people over here, people there, and there's just so much going on. Right. Whereas like in TV shows or in that situation, it's like, oh, thank God everybody's quiet. <laughs> like <laughs> we can just do this. Right. And so that's just the, that's just the way that I am. And so I, I enjoy situations like that more. And so, and I think again, kind of, I don't want to say learning how to, be that way, but just kind of, again, I, I think a lot of perspective, learning how to reframe, you know, the situations because it, 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 it legitimately is very different from qualifying to that step ladder where everything is quiet. And some people find that quiet unsettling and it can be the very first time, but if you can just kind of learn how to reframe it, it's just like, oh, it's quiet. Like every, it's so different. It's just like, no, it's just, it's, it's peaceful. We have time to think we can breathe or, Again, but that's some, that's just how I've learned how to look at that situation as something that's not different or scary. How do you um, mentally prepare for a tournament? Another great question. So like I said, I'm a little bit of a planner. So I like to make sure that, you know, I have everything that I need. Um, again, we don't find out the pattern until we get to an event. And so, again, making sure my arsenal is prepared as much as I can. Like as, you know, PWBA members, we can get things drilled on the truck. So if there is a piece that we're missing, you know, we can fill that spot. So that's very nice. If you, Even if you don't have the right ball, you know, there's an opportunity, you know, to get something in your bag that fills that spot. Right. And just doing what I can to stay in the moment. And to stay present with myself and not have to worry about all the external things. And so making, again, so that's making sure I'm prepared and whatever, again, making sure that everything is packed, you know, again, this, these are very like simple things, but I feel like they do make a difference, you know, making sure everything that's packed, they that need packed, your balls are, you know, surfaces, all that stuff is good. Um, and mentally being in the best place that I can, not worrying about external things. Like if it has nothing to do with bowling, I don't particularly want to hear about it Yeah, <laughs> type of thing. I try to minimize, I try to minimize that sure. and making sure that I have things in place to, I don't want to say like decompress, but it can't always be about bowling like all the time. And so like, for example, like Stephanie is a ball and I, um, we room together on tour. And so we try to do, we try to do things, you know, outside of bowling to just kind of like take a step away because it it could just get too overwhelming if that's all you're doing. And so finding time to like step away, have a meal, you know, we like to go mini golfing, stuff like that. I personally love to read. That's a way that I like decompress. So like after a block. I just like to read. So it's just like not really thinking I'm, I'm immersed in a story. I don't have to, I don't have to make any decisions anymore until in the next like two hours. <laughs> Who is the messier roommate? You or Stephanie? Oh, dang. We're both pretty organized, but I guess by default her, <laughs> cause I don't think it's me. Yeah, I say, you don't seem like someone who'd be messy. <laughs> yeah. She's not messy. So we do, we do pretty good. Yeah. So we all have times when we find ourselves lost. Um, And what do you do to find your way out of that? I feel like that's another million dollar question. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're in a tournament and you're, you know, bowling for the championship and your opponent puts up three strikes and maybe you strike the first ball, but then ball jumps on you and you split and then you miss an easy spare. And now suddenly you're like, oh, no. What do you do in that fourth frame? How do you get yourself back on track? You just got to flush it away. It's something that um, Coach Mike Shady has told us at Team USA Camp, finding ways to to get past it, you know, and he literally uses like a visualization of like a toilet, like literally flush it away because focusing on that does nothing. It serves you no purpose to 
think about that frame or to be upset about that frame. Like, yeah, you could be frustrated. I mean, it, sometimes anger, you know, can be a, a useful emotion, but not all the time. And so finding ways to not dwell on that missed frame or that missed spare and finding ways to stay present. Like I said, it's so easy to, again, stay with that miss or to jump ahead right. to the next frame already. Like, and another thing that Mike Shady says, or, you know, even Dr. Dean is, you know, the most important frame is, you know, the one that you're in and doing your best to stay focused, stay with the process and not let those emotions overtake you. Like I said, anger can be useful. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. Like some of my, some of my best some of my wins have been angry <laughs> angry because of moments like you're like moments like you're talking about. Yeah. Like I, I can't stand stuff like that. And so there is an element of digging deep to get yourself out of that hole. Like the last title that I won was in Reno and I was playing Rio Jose Rodriguez in the final and she demolished us in qualifying. Like she was in number one seed. She just ran us over like a truck and I don't remember my first couple frames, but I didn't really strike. And I had one open and Maria like popped off like five. And I'm yeah. like, well, okay. <laughs> and so, but like, when I, but, but like I said earlier, it's just, I've been this way for a long time. And it's something that my coach has even said about me is that every shot matters to me. Like whether I'm winning or I'm losing, like every shot has meaning. Every shot matters to me. And so like in that match against Maria, I was like, well, we're here. This is what's happening. This is the reality. We are just going to make the best shots that we can from this moment on, from this moment, this exact one, from this moment on, we're just going to make the best shot that we can and just see what happens. And so I threw the back six at her. It's just like, okay, I, I finished first. She had to, she finished last. And I was like, okay, you threw the back six. Just, it, it is just out in the world. And so I came back to one of the ball reps and he's just like, well, she needs to mark. And I'm like, well, okay. Like I, at least, at least I did that. I, I did that much. And it, turn, it turns out she's seven ten. And, and so I just, I, I won that match and I feel like, to me, that is a great reminder of just staying present, not giving up, not getting emotional about the situation. Like, oh my God, like I, I made it to the finals and I did this, like right. that, like I said, that's just not useful. That's just not going to do me any good in that moment. And so, and like I said earlier, just my family, just not quitters, bonds don't quit, don't do anything half-assed. So in that moment, just like, well, like I said, we're going to make the best shots that we can from this moment on. And so. I think I somewhat answered the question. I yeah, feel like yeah, staying, did. yeah, staying, staying present is very important and learning how to let those frames go. Holding on to them doesn't yeah. do you any good. There's no point in staying in the past like that. Right. What is your strategy when you're in a ball and you can tell like this, I should not be in this ball. And obviously there's a lot of variables depending on what, what you're seeing with that ball. But do you have a kind of a system in mind of, what you can go to? I try to ask myself questions to help the brain start thinking. Um, so naturally the first question is like, okay, is it burning up or is it going too long? Hmm. And I feel like even that question alone can be a hard one because some, some, they, sometimes they look the same. They really do. Like even at this level, you're still as pros, we still ask ourselves the same question. Like, is it, is it going long? Is it burning up? I think it's burning up, but I can't really. <laughs> and so, and then, and, you know, and once you answer that question, then you can start kind of going through your little tree or however you visually like, you know, that little flow chart in your brain about what your balls do. And sometimes it is, you know, again, like it's an educated guess. So you, you think your ball is doing this. So you go to a ball that you think will counter whatever it is that you're doing. And then, if it does the right thing, then you made the right choice. But if it doesn't, it's like, oh, okay. It was actually the other thing right? <laughs> that was right. happening. I need to go to that side of the flow chart. And so it's, it's difficult in the sense that nobody wants to waste the frame. 
nobody wants to be wrong because you will be wrong. And like, I don't even, I don't even, I have a hard time even saying the word wrong because in bowling, I don't, I don't think there's like a right and a wrong. Again, it's the result. Did you get the result? Right. If the answer is no, then it's like, all right, well, it's okay. Yeah. You weren't, you weren't wrong. Just didn't do what you wanted it to do. <laughs> and so again, another way to reframe. Um, again, certain scenarios in your head. Right. Because if you just think you're wrong all the time, then you're you're going to start feeling like you're stupid. Because I've, I've been in that place. You know, you make maybe two or three wrong choices and you're like, well, I guess I don't know. <laughs> I don't know I what I'm I doing. I guess I don't know how to bowl anymore. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Right. And so, but again, keeping an open mind. It's because sometimes the ball that you didn't think was going to work is the one that is the one that works as crazy as that is sometimes. Because again, bowling's not always black and white. Sometimes, sometimes you miss something and that's okay. But that, but being able to be open-minded about your equipment or what a ball does, like, like for example, like I think Anthony Simonson, for example, is a really good example. Sometimes people, I think Anthony makes decisions and people, and people are like, why is he going to that ball? But it works. Anthony is just so great at seeing what he wants to see and just making a ball do that. And so Anthony has a very good visualization of bowling balls and the shapes that he's trying to create. Um, but 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 I'm not going to lie to you. There's times where I just dig down with a ball and I'm like, well, I know it's not right, but like <laughs> we're going to use it anyway. Right. So <laughs> I I have willpowered my way. Yeah, I've not there's not many times where you can out bowl bad ball reaction and. It's a stupid flex on my part, but I can, I have, <laughs> and I admit it. There's times where I'm like, I should not be throwing this ball, but I like it. And this is what, this is it. Yeah. This is all we got. That was me last and night. <laughs> see, and and sometimes it works. Sometimes yeah. it works. You know, you're just like, this ball isn't it, but I know, I know what it's going to do. And sometimes, and sometimes that's literally the best that you have. It's like, well, it's not striking, but I know what it's going to do. And at least I can spare. And sometimes you have, you just have days like that where it's like, well, it's a spare day. How would your friends and family describe you? Oh man. Determined. Determined, stubborn. Compassionate, sweet, funny. Um, I don't just overall a hard worker. Like I said, I take pride in a lot of things that I do and I want to do things right or to the best of my abilities so a favorite one amongst my my bowling tribe is a bulldog i get Mm. called bulldog a lot i think i think that's a good one yeah bulldog's a good one what makes you feel most alive most alive i feel like you're hitting like a life question I mean, I, I don't have like a clever answer. I feel like winning isn't a very clever answer, but just in those moments in bowling where you make the right decisions and things are working out and there's not a lot of thought and it's very freeing. I feel like I feel like I'm most authentic in those moments where just not thinking about anything. I'm just bowling and I'm having fun doing the thing that I like to do. And same thing with winning. It's a very freeing feeling. On those hard days when bowling is very difficult, is that what keeps you coming back? Is knowing that, that you know, for every valley there's two mountains and that you'll eventually get back there and then you'll have that feeling again? Yeah, and I hate losing. <laughs> I, hate lo- I hate losing more than I like winning. Hmm. So, <laughs> so I think that's what gets me coming back. I just, I hate because again, like when we do a tour stop, like that pattern's done. We don't, we're not going to bowl on it again. But there's a part of me that's just like, damn, I'm not going to go two weeks in a row, like not hitting a pattern or not scoring the way that I want. But yeah, that challenge. I think that challenge is what gets me coming back. And I like, I like being able to conquer challenges, so being able to figure out that pattern, finding a way to score, beating people. Like I just, I just like winning. I like beating people. You know, bowling is something that I've, you know, luckily found that I was naturally good at. And then with some practice and direction, you know, got great at. 
And I like being able to showcase that. I like to be, I mean, it's a performance Mm -hmm. of sorts. Like, yeah, you're literally, you know, doing an act, but I find, you know, bowling to be a performance of sorts. And I like being up there. I like showcasing it and, you know, being around other people who also compete at a high level. I like being in that environment. And so just, again, there's just certain places or spaces where you feel authentic or you feel most like yourself. And I feel like competing in bowling is when I'm most like myself. Like I don't have to really explain myself. Like, you know, in those moments that are great or even those moments that are bad, I feel like I don't have to, like I said, I don't have to really explain myself. And I think that's very, it's very nice to be able to be in a space that allows you to do that. Who or what has been your greatest teacher? Probably my my dad and my coach that I've had since I was 13. And so my dad in the sense of, again, being that like unconditional place of support. And he never necessarily like pushed me. Like bowling has over, always been a decision that I have like made. I didn't really have a dad that was that really like pushed me that way. It was more like, okay, this is what, okay, this is what you want to do. Okay. This is how we're going to do it. And this is how we're going to make it work and finding ways to help me get to where I want to be without again, like pushing me like to it. And so just having him as a place to, as like a soundboard right. and to like, actually like physically, how do we get from A to B? Right. And having that support has been really nice. And then my coach in the sense of, again, just more on the bowling side. He, again, that's, I guess that's where the pushing comes from. It didn't really come from my dad. It came from like the coach. Like we are the ones that are like on the lane together um, going through this journey that way. And I think it's very special when you have someone in your life that believes in you that way. And like one of his favorite stories to tell people is, so I went to him when I was 13 and my dad tells the story differently than like my coach does. My dad says four months, my coach says four weeks, but either way they were like, he says that like, as soon as like I watched your daughter throw a ball, like she was going to be great. She's going to go to any college that she wants and she's going to be one of the greatest bowlers ever. And to have somebody like that in your corner, I just, I wish- Right. If, if if everybody had somebody like that in their lives, I'd, man, everybody would be able to just to do anything that they wanted. Yeah. And so, yeah, very grateful to have someone like that in my corner that believes in me. And so, yeah, in those moments on tour that are hard and the moments where I'm like getting down on myself, because I mean, the last two years have been okay, you know, nothing nothing great, nothing bad, but you know, there's times where I got down at myself and he's just like, what are you doing? Like, why are you, why are you being like this? Yeah. It's like, you're, you're Julia Bond. Like, what are you doing? Stop it. And so again, having just having somebody like that in my life has been really important to keep pushing me. Cause there's times where like, yeah, you, you feel like you hit, like I was talking about those different levels, right? Like at every level, I always wondered like, man, can I, like after high school, it's just like, man, like, am I going to do well in college? And like, you know, and then, then boom, winning a national championship, being an anchor and then trying to make team USA. It's just like, man, am I, am I good enough to make team USA go to team trials, you know, be in the top four, make, you know, been on team USA for the last seven years. And so, but yeah, to have somebody be there at those different steps of my life and believing in me to make it to that next level is yeah has been very important to me you know and I'm really glad that I have you know not again my father you know my own life being supportive but having another figure in my life that you know is also like a father to me so really grateful for those for those relationships and pushing me in the ways that I needed you know to my dad for being a dad the way that I needed him and then my coach for pushing me in those moments what are you most looking forward to in the upcoming uh, 2024 PWBA tour season, and will we see a return of the side ponytail? Oh my gosh, what a question! What a man! I don't, man! I don't know. I'll answer the hair question first. Okay. <laughs> like I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like I just, 
I, I don't have long hair anymore. I don't really mm. want long hair. And the only way for me to do it is to have long hair. I'm like, and I'll tell you something about me. Like, like I said, I was stubborn earlier. There's certain parts of me, like, if you like tell me to do something and I don't really want to do it, but you tell me to do it, I'm yeah. not doing it. Yeah. If someone expects so, like, you again, to do no the ponytail, the- you don't want to do the ponytail anymore. Yes, exactly. And I'm not trying to be spiteful. I'm not trying to be yeah. like a jerk. It's just like, oh, you like the side pony? I don't really want to do it. <laughs> You're just rebellious, naturally. <laughs> a little bit. And like, and it's like, I want my hair to be the way that I want it. Yeah. And maybe it'll, maybe it'll come back. I don't know. Maybe if people stopped asking for it, <laughs> maybe it'll make a comeback. <laughs> That's not a very nice answer, but I don't know. Like, I, th- I feel like people are allowed to change and experiment with their styles and hair is just hair. And so we'll see. But as far as 2024 goes, I'm I'm looking forward to, and I don't know if I have found the right words for this yet, but I want to go about all of that differently. Like, you know, when I came home from tour this year, you know, I was just a little, again, overall disappointed with the year, but it wasn't bad. But just kind of like, just kind of feeling in that funk mm-hmm. that you can kind of get in, which is right. like, yeah, I'm disappointed and the tour's over and, you know, all that. But I bounced back way faster than I thought I would. And a lot of that is because the routines I had at home. And I was just like, wow, like, am I in a better mood because I'm home or is it something else? And like, when I dug into it, it's like, no, when I'm home, I have these like set kind of routines to kind of. I don't want to say get my life back in order, but I just, I was just like, wow, like I, I'm intentional with these things at home. I want to be more intentional with these things on the road. And so I'm really excited. And again, I don't really, I haven't gotten that far. I just know that I want to be more intentional okay. with the things that I do on tour. And, and this is more like a personal goal. Like I want to be, I don't know if authentic is the right word. I just feel like sometimes on tour, like in interviews or when we're talking to people, I feel like we try to say like the right answer. Like, it's like, oh, like in your brain, you're like, I felt so terrible today. Like this sucked. And then someone asks you, it's like, oh, how did today go? And you're like, oh, it was fine. You know, I just, (laughs) I don't know. Some insert, some basic generic answer that's not even like, and it's not that we're not it's not that we're trying to be de- dishonest to people but sometimes i feel like there's a pressure to be always saying the right thing and if you're mad you don't don't be a jerk this is not this is not me condoning like you know just stop, say whatever you want be a jerk but to just be just more honest about what's going on like I, people getting to know maybe me more i feel again i've been around for a while i feel like people have a general idea about who i am but i feel like there's still a disconnect and so, again, being more intentional with my answers, being more like authentic that way, because I mean, I feel like this is bold yet controversial. I feel like we talk about bowling balls so much. Yeah. Yeah. We're bowling. We're professionals. Like, right. Yeah. We are promoting a product and that's great. And I love it. But there's times where it's just like, I want like, I want you to get to know like me. Right. Like, yeah, it is about like the balls and I know you want to know what I was using and that's fine, but just getting to know people more like us as bowlers, like us as people. And so kind of like, again, I I feel like this conversation was great and I would like to do more of that. I want people to see the women on the PWBA more instead of like asking them, how'd you play the lanes? Right. You know, And, and again, a part of us answering in maybe a more honest and authentic way. Like I said, I don't really know what that looks like, but that's kind of my goals, you know, personal and just overall. We'll see. No, I'm glad you said that about um, getting to know bowlers more because I, I do feel like, and that, that's one of the reasons why I started this podcast. One, because I felt like the mental game of bowling wasn't really something that was talked about a whole lot. And most of the time, yeah, you get into people want to know about equipment and lane play and that kind of stuff, which is all important parts of bowling but but you are a person and and there is obviously stories behind your success and and struggles and life in general and that's kind of one of the things i i wanted to bring about in this interview and and you've been been great to share all those 
Well, thank you. And like, it, right. And I just, and I think that's a really important work and, you know, and I'm glad you're doing something like this. I think it's amazing. And I like interactions like this and, you know, and I, and I think you're going to hear a lot of great stories from other bowlers, you know, that again, like you said, conversations can go in so many different ways. So it might start off as like a mental game question, but then we start going in a different direction. And so I think it's great. It's a great opportunity for people to see more of that side, like, because again, like, and I think, you know, and maybe another like bold yet controversial opinion is I feel like female bowlers, we don't always get the opportunity to speak candidly that way. Or there's certain like, you know, like I'm kind of generalizing, but you might have like men on the tour that maybe act a certain way or they say a certain thing and people are like, oh, just, it's just that guy. It's fine. But then you have like a female bowler maybe say something and they're like, who does she think she is? And it's just like, man, stop <laughs> it. Get out of here. And so, but we are just as competitive right. and, you know, just as confident, like as men can be. And I feel like we don't always, you don't always get to hear that from us because there might be maybe some type of stigma or maybe, maybe people aren't ready <laughs> to hear that yet, but I, I want to hear that more. So last question, uh, would you share your most favorite bowling memory? Ooh, favorite bowling memory. I'll have to go back to college. It's not particularly like good memory, like in its like core. And so in 2017, we were at the NCAA national championships and it looks a little different than it does now. Like we had like a qualifying day and then we went into like a bracket, like double elimination. And we played Yumi's and we just, we, I don't want to say ran him over, but we, we won that match. Like it was done, but it turns out during the match, we, we broke a rule. We did a substitution error on a rule that I didn't even know, like, mm. <laughs> and so if you take somebody out of the lineup and put somebody back in, the person that came out can't go to the practice pairs. NCAA has something called practice pairs where your bench can warm up. And, but in that situation, like once they come out, they can't go there until like the next match starts. And unfortunately our, our head coach told her to go warm up. And so what that means is that the girl that came in for her, any frame that she bowled was a zero mm. from when she came in. And so what, what turned into us running Yumi's over turned into a tie. Oh. And so we had to go to a five frame roll off. But the problem was that we still had to take a zero in that girl's frame. And so in that situation, it was our two hole. And so we had our first frame, zero, and then, you know, then the back three. And we're kind of devastated <laughs> because yeah. if you if you do the math, like Yumi's just needs a double. Like if they go double the first frame, like mathematically, we're just right. We're done without even having to do anything. Right. And so, but luckily for us, Yumi's doesn't double. They get to their 10th frame, their anchor strikes the first frame. And then I strike my first frame in the 10th and their anchor doesn't, uh, she splits. So she doesn't get the double. And so mathematically, we still have a chance. Like we had to go sheet in order to even do anything. And, and I did it. Like I got all three in the 10th. And the reason that that moment is so special to me is because that situation you can't ever plan for. There's no situation where you're like, oh, yeah, we're we're going to go into this tournament and then we're going to just break a rule that nobody's ever heard of and get the <laughs> stupidest penalty <laughs> I've ever heard of in my life. And so that's just it's 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 never happened before. And I don't think it's going to happen since because now everybody knows this rule exists <laughs> because of us and just the coming together. You know, once we realized the situation was, I cried. Like, hmm. like once I realized what it was, I was just like, are you kidding me? We did, we came this far to screw up this way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But once, but once we got over that feeling, we, we dug deep, we got in there and we're like, this is it. Like, this is it. I don't care what, like, whatever is happening, you are going to make your shot. Like, mm -hmm. if there was ever one shot I needed from you, it's now. Yeah. And we, and we did it. And it was just so clutch. It was a clutch moment for us as a team. And we ended up making the TV show. We made a run for the TV show. And unfortunately lost. 
So that sucks. But that moment sticks out to me because, like I said, we dug deep and came together in a moment that I just, again, you would never think would ever happen. But it happened to us and we, you know, came together. And I just was really proud of us, you know, and I think about that moment a lot, honestly. Yeah, that's an awesome story. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you, Julie, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's been amazing chatting with you and getting to know you uh, as a bowler and as a person. So thank you for sharing all your stories with us and knowledge and insight. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I had a really good time talking to you too. Again, this was a wonderful opportunity to be able to, and for people to get to know me a little bit more and you know, hear some stories. And hopefully there's an opportunity where I can come back. I would love to. Hopefully have you back on to, to talk about your next title. Oh, I would love that. We'll, we'll plan for it. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Thanks again. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Join us next time on The Bowler's Mind. <laughs>